the problem isn't that more and more young people experience eco-anxiety because that's actually a sign of your humanity. It's a sign of your empathy that you're awake. Yeah. The problem is that more adults in positions of power do not feel that eco-anxiety. Fossil fuels in my lifetime will become a thing of the past. That mm -hmm. is true. Yeah. And yet they want to be able to extract as much from the ground as possible, as much money as possible mm -hmm. for as long as possible. You know, there's a vested interest in yeah. keeping us stuck in the past. Mm. And that's why we all have a responsibility to actually reject those stories that have been impressed upon us and say, well, I'm going to do something radically different. Welcome to Get Lost Education where we invite change makers, green leaders, artists and activists who have created their own paths and affected positive change in their communities and our world. You know, in my own journey, it was only by getting lost so many times that I was able to discover myself, learn about the world around me, my own passions and what impact I wanted to have on this world. And that's why I'm here at Green School Bali. You know, this is a place where we are rethinking education and we're reimagining what a school is and can be. We're empowering the next generation of change makers. And today we are meeting one such change maker who's been empowering youth in over 50 countries to cultivate mindsets of agency, purpose and resilience in the face of the climate crisis. Clover Hogan is making an impact through her youth nonprofit Force of Nature and has worked alongside the world's leading authorities on sustainability within the boardrooms of Fortune 500 companies and inside classrooms around the world. Today, we are extremely thrilled and I'm honoured to have Clover on the show. Welcome to Get Lost Education, Clover. Thank you so much for having me. So how does it feel being back on this awesome, <laughs> epic Bali campus? It feels really surreal and incredibly special. I think sometimes when I think back on my education at Green School, mm. I feel that it's maybe a figment of my imagination, but it's very much real. It's very much mm. here. Now, a lot of people at Green School and, and beyond know of some of the amazing work you're doing with um, Forces of Nature. Yeah? Force of Nature, Force yeah. of Nature uh, around the climate, uh, eco-anxiety, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But let's go back a little bit and let's, let's, I'd like to learn a little bit about your childhood and you know, where you grew up and some memories from that to get a gauge of who you are. Yeah, so I grew up in tropical North Queensland in Australia. But yeah, so that's where I grew up. That was home for me. Mm. And you will know very well that all of the rumours of Australia are true. So I grew up fishing frogs out of the toilet, um, dodging snakes that hung from the ceiling. I used to avoid doing my schoolwork so that I could go down and rescue sea turtles that had beached themselves on the shore. So it was a beautiful, beautiful upbringing and childhood. Yeah. I honestly spent more time outside than in and nature was where I found my solace and security. It was my safe space. When I was 11 years old, I suddenly discovered how much the natural world was under threat. Okay. So I'd grown up in this kind of perfect nature bubble. And then I discovered documentaries like The Cove and Food Inc and mm. An Inconvenient Truth. Mm. and. As an 11 year old girl, I sat glued to my computer screen, staring at these images of million year old forests being bulldozed to produce McDonald's burgers. Um, you know, mm. watching graphs projected by Al Gore that showed how quickly we were kind of devouring the earth and, and how good we were at pretending otherwise. And that was my first experience of eco anxiety. I didn't have the language for it back then, but this overwhelming grief and anger and sadness at what we had already done to the planet many mm. decades before I was even born. So I think, you know, more than anything else, I felt really, really confused. Mm. I hadn't learned about the climate crisis in school. We hadn't seen it in the media. Um, we hadn't talked about, you know, the four-legged animals on our dinner plates or their climate impacts. And so it was in that moment, amidst the kind of anxiety and fear about the future that I was inheriting, that I wanted to understand, you know, why is it that this isn't in the public consciousness? Why is it that we've kind of shut down in the face of the climate crisis? And what can we do to wake people up to this challenge before we kind of hurtle over this cliff that climate scientists are desperately trying to warn us of? Mm. 
Was there anyone around in your life then that was an influence to oh, you to, yes. to get you through that? Because, you know, as an 11-year-old, yeah. that's a pretty grown-up realisation to have. Yeah, I was very lucky in that um, I had my sister who was kind of a nature warrior at the time. Mm -hmm. She used to come home with these giant yellow pythons kind of slung around her neck and drop them on the couch at home. And so she really helped me navigate those feelings while continuing to foster my love for the natural world. Mm. I, I didn't want to lose that relationship, you know, from a place of real fear of what was really happening to it. And I think even while watching those documentaries, I felt the despair, but I also felt this enormous inspiration looking at people on the front lines who were getting on, telling those stories, you know, doing something to stop them. And mm -hmm. I kind of made that decision at 11 that I was like, I want to commit the rest of my life trying to be like those people, trying to be an environmentalist and, and be a voice for the voiceless. Mm. So that's when as an 11 year old and then as a 13 year old, <laughs> you came to Green School Bali. What was what happened? There was something magic that happened from age 11 to 13 that really pushed you into... Yeah. I was becoming increasingly unhappy in my education system in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so it was in that kind of crisis moment that my mum received not one, but two emails in the same week about this place called The Green School. And I'd started to really, you know, voice my desire to be an activist, be an environmentalist. I didn't yet know what that looked like, mm. but we looked into it more and more. And my parents, being the two crazy people they are, <laughs> decided to basically pack up our family so I could go to this wallless bamboo classroom in the middle mm. of the jungle. And it's, uh, I think we can all agree, it's the best decision that we ever made as a family. What was Green School Bali like? That's a while ago, two, yeah, 2000 and... I think that was like 2000 12 or 2013 yeah. it's uh i mean it's not that different, not that different. but it was radically different <laughs> from the education i had in australia mm. i often compare that to this kind of like concrete jungle where you're kind of told to stay inside yeah. and you know put your head down and and follow the script and green school could not have been more different from that but I think the best way to capture it is that in my Australian education, you know, students were really being trained to pursue convenient careers that you didn't necessarily have any love for, but would allow you to fit into the status quo in the workplace. Mm, mm. Whereas when I came to the green school, my teachers instead asked me, which problems do you want to solve? And something I've reflected on since then is that now working with young people all the time, you know, we often don't know who we are. That's a very loaded question. Yeah. Yet if you ask a young person, what's a problem that you care about? You yeah. know, what's something that triggers that fire within you? Every single person you talk to will have an answer. And so I think, you know, focusing on the problems that activated something within me was how I found myself, how I discovered my skills and, and how I really found that passion. Mm. Have you got any favorite memories from your school? <laughs> Oh, I have a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I um, best capture my green school initiation um, mm -hmm. with this course that we took in year eight. So we were studying Lord of the Fri Flies, yeah. um, which is pretty standard in like curriculums around the mm -hmm. world. But our English teacher, Ibu Mary, decided that it wasn't enough for us to just read the book. We needed to actually live the book. And so our teachers took us to a deserted island off the coast of Bali. And we learned how to make our own food, how to catch our own food. Uh, we learned survival skills mm -hmm. to be out in nature. And it really imbued in all of us this sense of resilience, the need for cooperation when in moments of you know crisis. and. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really prime example of this kind of hands-on learning, which is, you know, not just digesting information for the sake of it, but how can I actually use those skills? How can I use those ideas to yeah. help me in the real world? It was obviously really important for you in terms of your life pathway mm. to get outside of a traditional education system, Absolutely. outside of an Australian culture itself even, which we were talking about a little bit before, mm. um, and inside a place that nourishes who you were as an individual and, and specifically in terms of, you know, where you are now in terms mm -hmm. of your work with climate. Yeah, absolutely. Can you imagine a you know, force of nature being a force of nature <laughs> if you had a, if you hadn't have been at Green School Bali? No. <laughs> no? No, I mean, it was an environment that I wanted to go to. It was a place where I was, you know, driven to learn mm. and, um, I mean, really all of those aspirations and dreams about, you know, working in the climate space in terms of building force of nature, they were very much birthed here at the Green School. I remember your, your Greenstone. Mm. So our grade 12 students do a Greenstone passion project. It's like our final exam. Your Greenstone was 
on uh, eco-anxiety, yeah? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the experience and where, how that sort of catapulted you from an active green school student into the adult world where you are now. Yeah, so when I was 16, I joined my peers and teachers in Paris for COP21. Mm. So this, the biggest climate meeting to date, where world leaders come together and actually say, all right, here's the stake that we're putting in the ground. Here's how we're going to solve this huge problem. And before that point, I'd been responding to issues on the front lines. I'd been focused on very grassroots, localized solutions. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I was going to participate in a, in a global conversation yeah. with the people who had been entrusted with solving the challenges like climate change. And I went in with this, you know, kind of starry eyed optimism that, you know, maybe we wouldn't kind of like hold hands and sing Kumbaya, but, you know, world leaders would come together and respond with the urgency that this emergency required. Yeah, you'd think. You yep. would think. Yeah. But? <laughs> but let me tell you, mm. it was it was a very, very different event that I rocked up to. And instead of, you know, transformative action, instead of true leadership, we were confronted with incrementalism, token solutions, greenwashing on a scale that I had never seen before. Um, we went to something called the Sustainable Innovation Farm, which was sponsored by BMW and Coca-Cola and Shell iconic polluters contributing to the climate and ecological crisis, which we'd learned about in our media, media studies classes yeah, at Green School. Yeah. And um, it was like going to, you know, a conference on lung cancer sponsored by Philip Morris. Yeah. And so I felt incredibly disillusioned. Mm. I felt frustrated. And I think for the first time in my activism journey, I felt truly powerless. And in all of that, as I looked at the people around me, as I looked at my teachers, mm. as, I, as I looked at my peers and the decision makers at the table, I saw that same powerlessness in their eyes too. Mm. You know, whether it was an anxious 11 year old who felt, well, I don't have the skills or I'm not the expert, or it was the cautious corporate leader saying, well, I've been told for the past 30 years to sustain the status quo and deliver value to shareholders. Yeah. They too felt way too small to do anything. And so I kind of had this brewing in my mind when I came back to the green school and with my graduation kind of on the horizon, um, I attended a class, an environmental studies class uh, with one of my teachers, Puck Noan. Puck Noan. And he yes. introduced me to a word that would totally change the course of my life. So he said, have you heard about this thing called ecophobia? It was coined in 1996 by a psychologist called David Sabel, mm -hmm. and he found that ecophobia is when people feel powerless in the face of cataclysmic environmental change. And did that start? And I was like, "Oh my God, this is a thing! This is <laughs> like, a thing! I haven't imagined this. Like, there's an actual phenomenon of more and more people shutting down in the face of these huge issues. Mm. And as I began to join those dots in my brain, I was like, "Oh, what if the challenge?" isn't in fact the climate crisis, but how powerless we feel in the face of it. And that was, I think, a multiple year journey in the making wow. and, and catalyst moment in the making. But that was what I committed my um, research project to and, mm. and my greenstone. And back then it was like scraping the bottom of the barrel of the internet to mm. find any kind of literature or research. Um, but since then, I've spent the past few years researching this in more and more depth. Mm. And Force of Nature, my organization, has pioneered a lot of the research around the intersection between between mindset, mental health, and the climate crisis, yeah. and most importantly, the interventions we can actually use to shift our mindsets from powerlessness to feeling really empowered to do something. Yeah, right. So, an amazing Green School Bali experience, mm. culminating Greenstone, graduated 2016, yes. and then off to the UK to university, was it? I did, a, yeah. as a backup plan, apply to a couple of universities, yeah. and, and I got in. Yeah. Um, but I had that, I mean, my parents, as you can probably tell from the story of like packing up our lives in Australia, mm. have always been very supportive. And one piece of advice they've always given me is follow your heart no matter where yeah. it takes you. And I said to them, I mean, my dad dropped out of university to protest the Vietnam War in the 60s. So he wasn't really of an academic background anyway. But I said to them, I was like, I think my skills can be much better used solving problems than, you know, going and studying something for another four years. Mm. I think university can be amazing if you have a real focus of a discipline you want to dig your teeth into. But I actually think for a lot of people, maybe even most people, just getting out in the field yeah. is the best learning journey you can go on.
So my first job out of green school was at a company called Impossible Foods in Silicon Valley, um, making meat from plants. Mm -hmm. I met the founders at COP21 when I was with green school. And um, yeah, I brought all of the knowledge that I'd kind of been cultivating around our psychology in the context of climate to this incredible product, which has now completely blown up across America yeah. and internationally as well. Um, meat that is made from plants that cooks, tastes, feels, bleeds just like the real thing. Um, and that was an awesome crash course for me in how business can really be a force for good. I think I would mm. kind of vilified business up until that point seeing the big multinationals of the world and, and how much they'd contributed to this crisis. And then suddenly I was within a disruptor company that was doing such incredible work to really deliver the solution. Um, and from Silicon Valley, I moved to London. I started working as a sustainability consultant, mm -hmm. um, consulting the companies that I'd made mockumentaries about in my mm -hmm. media studies okay. classes. Yeah, and um, I think that just continued to reinforce what I'd already seen in Paris of mm. this powerlessness in business leaders. I was also volunteering in schools in the UK and kind of the opposite of this mainstream rhetoric that young people felt empowered and passionate. I talked to a lot of young people who were terrified of the future they were inheriting. That's when I started to develop the language around eco-anxiety mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the more nuanced facets of how we respond to the crisis. And from there, I really realized that we needed a total shift. You know, we need a revolution in mindset. Yeah. And the reality is with the climate and ecological crisis, we've actually had the solutions and the technology and the resources we've needed to solve this crisis for decades, decades before I was even on this planet. Yeah. And yet, critically, what we lack is the mobilization. It's the mindset to say, yes, this is solvable. Yes, this is achievable. But we need to throw everything in our power at it. Mm. So it was from that place that Force of Nature was born. Someone told me that sometimes you go back and do a bit of guest lecturing, though, <laughs> don't you? So you don't need a university degree to, to actually go back and... Yes, that was a, a surreal moment. I lectured at Oxford and Cambridge in the UK, these kind of Ivy Leagues. And I was sort of saying to the students there, I was like, you don't need this whole university thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was very cool. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit, a bit more about ecophobia, eco-anxiety. You mm. talked about even yourself having a realisation and you had a... It sounds like, I know, I know where you grew up. Mm. It, it is paradise. It it's is nature yeah. paradise. You had a, an opportunity, whether it was from your unique surrounding or your family, to be self-aware of this anxiety. Mm. Um, do you think most children or youth today don't even have that awareness that they're suffering from eco-anxiety? Is it becoming more real? I believe that they have the awareness when they're empowered with the language to put their feelings. Okay. Um, I experienced eco-anxiety from the time I was 11, but I had no idea that that's what it was. And I think without that education around the power of eco-anxiety as a force for change um, and everything that I've learned over the past few years, in many ways I thought those feelings were a weakness. Mm. Um, I was told a lot growing up that I was, you know, very sensitive. And I think I conditioned myself to think that, okay, well, I need to run away from those feelings. Yeah, right. And I think to, to try and cope with the climate science and the terrifying headlines, I almost went too far in that direction of like, okay, I need to be unrelentingly optimistic. I have to, you know, be super positive. And I think I almost established that presence you know whenever I would publicly speak or go on a panel and uh, that all kind of came crashing down in November of 2019 uh, during the Australian wildfires yeah right. and I couldn't actually keep up with my grief I was bursting into tears in the shower on my way to work in the mm. middle of meetings mm. Because every time I opened up my phone, I was seeing these images of my country engulfed in flames and the terrifying headlines of, you know, two billion animals incinerated by this inferno. Mm. Seeing, you know, Instagram stories from my friends of them, you know, standing on the roofs of their homes, you know, holding hoses, trying to keep back the flames. And it was kind of at odds with everything that I'd held to be true and I didn't realize it at the time but seeing those images almost felt like a personal failure yeah right okay it was you know I've committed my whole life to climate activism and still that's not enough mm. you know and up until that point 
climate change was something I'd read about in articles. It was something I'd watched from a distance mm. through documentaries mm. of this kind of future threat that we would inherit, right? When I was maybe in my 30s or 40s. And instead, I was seeing climate change as the thing that was taking away my country, the thing that was taking away my community. It was like watching the loss of my childhood mm. and the nature that had made me an environmentalist in the first place. And it was then that I spoke to a um, climate psychotherapist who okay. has become an incredible mentor and supporter to Force of Nature. And she said, all that you're feeling is a healthy response. Okay, let's get into that. Because, yeah. Yeah, because so, anxiety is all automatically, we think, negative. Yes, right. Yeah, we live on, in a culture that tells us there's such thing as good feelings and bad feelings. And it's like this kind of toxic positivity of mm -hmm. you should feel empowered, you should achieve, you know, you should feel happy all the time. And in fact, you know, to be human is to experience the grief and right. the anger and the sadness and the stress. And in fact, what she told me is that the problem isn't that more and more young people experience eco-anxiety because that's okay. actually a sign of your humanity. It's a sign of your empathy that you're awake. Yeah. The problem is that more adults in positions of power do not feel that eco-anxiety. And so she said, we don't need to fix the eco-anxiety. Mm. We need to fix the people in power so that they are awake to those feelings. And so they recognize the power of them rather than kind of blindly numbing ourselves to the situation. Um, and as a final point yeah. on that, you know, eco-anxiety wakes us up, right? Okay. It's the feelings that tell us something is not okay. They ring the internal alarm bells. Yet if we don't have the tools to navigate those feelings, to turn them into agency and action, mm -hmm. that's when they can tip into ecophobia. Right. So the feeling of powerlessness. Yeah, yeah. So we don't want the ecophobia. We want to learn how to cultivate the eco-anxiety in a way that it wakes culture and society up. Awesome. So there must, there's something missing then in society then if there's this disconnect between understanding of eco-anxiety and, and, and identifying that as a, as a positive thing, but mm. then... How do we transfer that eco-anxiety, especially from the leaders and the people that are running the place, yeah. into positive action? So, Big the question. human brain, really, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how deep you want to get with this, but... Deep. <laughs> okay, good. Um, we struggle to make sense of nuance and uncertainty, mm. right? We like to see the world in binaries. And you see that in the way we even talk about climate change. You know, we love these deadlines of, okay, well, this is the year when we need to solve climate change, right? Mm -hmm. And after then, it's too late. You see these doomsday clocks in New York City, which yeah, are like yeah. the countdown. They're so depressing. <laughs> um, but we want to think, okay, you know, it's, it's either now or never. And it is now or never. However, as the climate science already tells us, there's a certain level of climate collapse and tipping points that are already locked in. Yeah. Even if we completely changed every part of society tomorrow, yeah. we're still going to face, yeah. you know, wildfires like we've never seen, flooding like we've never seen, food system collapse. What all of that tells us is that what we need most is resilience. We need to be able to make sense of these mm -hmm. issues and we need to get our mindsets to a place where we still feel empowered to act where we can look in the face of all that grief and use it as our fuel mm. to really catalyze action. Now, what we've noticed in our conversations with business leaders and young people is that we all subscribe to the same stories that keep us feeling ecophobia, that keep us feeling powerless. And those stories sound something like, I'm just one in 7.8 billion people, I'm too small to make a difference, mm -hmm. or, uh, I hear business leaders saying, well, actually, it's not up to me. It's up to the policymaker. And then I talk to the policymaker and they say, well, it's not up to us. It's up to business. So mm. it's like this, you know, Russian roulette of finger pointing. And, you know, we all feel small and it's normal to feel that way. Like we wouldn't be human mm. if we didn't feel anxiety and stress in the face of a challenge like climate change. Yeah. But we need to critically rewrite those stories so that when we are confronted with the issue, we create space for the eco-anxiety, but we then have a story that facilitates us turning that into action. And we use a very simple acronym at yep. Voice of Nature, SEED with an A, which the shows us... Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, which shows us, you know, proven through psychological research mm -hmm. that our stories affect our ability to make decisions. So if my story is that I am powerless, mm -hmm. then my expectation is no matter what I do, no matter what changes I create, they won't really amount to anything. 
My attitude, therefore, is one of pessimism. Yeah. And of course, that does not cultivate an internal ecosystem where I feel empowered to make decisions that are going to serve myself and are going to mm. serve the planet. Mm. However, if I can begin to rewrite that story to I do have power, so long as I find the impact of focus, so long as I you know, identify the skills that I bring, then my expectation is with enough commitment, enough tenacity, of course I'll make a difference. Mm. Whether that's changing one person's mindset or that's starting a movement, I have that potential mm. within me. Mm. My attitude is therefore determined, a little bit more optimistic, optimistic like grounded mm. optimism. Mm. And then of course that creates an internal story that enables me to take action where I say, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's complex, but I'm going to show up and do it anyway. Yeah. And it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> What's your ultimate goal then? You know, you're a young, young climate activist, um, not about to retire. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. So where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? Let's go there. Ooh. I love doing these visualizations. Well, Force of Nature, two years after it was founded, is now a team of 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, we have over 60 volunteers around the world who are helping our mission in each of their corners of the world, from Kenya through Indonesia to the US. Mm, awesome. And so we're starting a grassroots movement of young people who feel empowered to turn their eco-anxiety into agency. But the bigger piece of this, the systemic institutional piece, are the conversations we're then having with decision makers. So once we get a young person to a place where they feel empowered through programs and curriculum that we've developed mm -hmm. alongside climate psychologists and experts in the field, once we get them to that place, we then enable them to walk the corridors of power, interface with these decision makers, and in doing so, shift the institutional mindset. Because if there's one thing we've seen working with business leaders, it's that there is a crisis of imagination. They want to do the thing. Yeah. They want to take action. Mm. And yet for them, imagining how we might do things differently is so far beyond what they've been conditioned to see, what they've been conditioned to focus on, that it feels impossible. But if you bring together the energy and creativity of youth, young people who haven't been around long enough for society to clip the wings of our imaginations, yeah. if you bring that youthfulness with the wisdom and knowledge of experience, you can shift mindsets intergenerationally. Mm. So for me in five years, it's still going to be leading force of nature, hopefully with maybe 200 people by then. Yep. Um, you know, and I think I've talked about this with our operations director. For us, success is, you know, hearing about force of nature projects and solutions that have been started in different corners of the world that we had nothing to do with and, and find out about, you know, two years into their growth. Mm, awesome. So um, for us, it's that it's that grassroots, but also connecting the grassroots to the systemic change that needs to happen. Clipping the wings um, of imagination. Do you think you have to unschool some people that come to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that your mindset after leaving Green School Bali was different to maybe the average teenager leaving a normal school? Absolutely. I think from such a young age, our view of what is possible is, you know, caged in. And through the education system, through, you know, our families, even if it's not consciously, you know, we're told this is the path for us and, and this is what is available to you. And so a lot of young people we work with, you know, feel very much trapped in that headspace, but they are in a unique position to disrupt their own mindsets. You know, they're at an age where they can begin to shift the way they see the world and change the stories that they subscribe to about themselves and about, you know, the future that we're inheriting. But there definitely needs to be unlearning. I mean, even if we look at problems like uh, plastic pollution, I was talking to Malati about this, another Green School alum, and uh, she said, you know, we need to unlearn what we've learned over the past, you know, 10, 20 years, because for our grandparents, plastic wasn't a thing that existed, right? My grandmother, I was talking to her about this, and she's like, oh, I still remember when we had the first Tupperware parties, right? Because here was this amazing material. We had no idea of the consequences or where it came from. So, you know, there is a huge kind of shift in, in the way that we think, in the way that we behave as well. And I think we need to unlearn a lot of the cultural conditioning that has pushed us toward extrinsic values of, you know, competition and comparison and consumption to consumption. intrinsic values of yeah. contribution and, and community and connection. Mm. Imagination's a big thing, you know. I think a lot of schools probably don't set down a uh, part of their curriculum that fosters <laughs> no. imagination and, and it's foundational, I think, to yeah. a better world is imagining that better world, mm -hmm. being a part of bringing that 
to reality. Isn't Absolutely. It? Absolutely. I mean, and I think that's even what we're struggling with in the mm -hmm. climate space. Um, I had a friend, Jack Curry, say to me recently, climate change is the story that we fail to tell. And right now, you know, a lot of media outlets are kind of stuck sounding the alarm. Yeah, right. And yet we're not talking about, okay, great, how do we respond? What mm -hmm. are the solutions that exist? You know, and I think I found that in myself as an activist, I spent so much time and energy focused on the problems that I was reacting against that I failed to take pause and think, you know, what is it that we're actually working toward? If we want to avoid, you know, this 50-50 scenario of climate dystopia, what does the alternative look like? Mm. What does a world look like where we operate fully on renewables, where we keep within planetary boundaries, where the purpose of a business isn't just to commodify nature and extract profit, but to actually give back to our community? And so we need to ask those questions yeah. if we have any hope of actually taking the first steps to and realizing those that questions vision. People think they're just unreasonable it's what are you doing unrealistic but it's time to start being realistic about this yeah. imagination that we've got yeah exactly very human thing imagine a better better place definitely and this, i think we can we could keep talking a lot more about that because i've got a th this, this is not about me but <laughs> this concept of the climate change even being a debatable thing the mm. climate change debate yeah. you think it's just a little bit of a distractor it's a little bit of let's spend all our energy over here debating whether this yeah. thing is real or not 100 i mean i think it is absolutely criminal that outlets like the bbc until a few years ago invited climate deniers onto television to have a conversation with actual climate scientists who know what they're talking about mm. to give the air of a debate when the debate shouldn't be is climate change real or even should we take action on climate it's which of these solutions should we be investing the most resource into you know yeah, we've sort of it's diversionary, isn't it? Yeah. It's distraction 101. And it's a tactic that has been used for decades by the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. You know, fossil fuel um, industry experts, the scientists within companies like Exxon, they were some of the first people to discover the climate crisis to, as have, has now been revealed through a number of leaks, you know, put together these reports saying this is going to be absolutely catastrophic for the whole of humanity, unlike any challenge we've ever seen. Mm. This is back in the 60s and 70s, yeah. right? Yeah. And so they knew and yet rather than using that information or bringing it into the public conscious they said no deny 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 deny, deny. and now that climate change is in our collective consciousness their new tactic is delay they know that we are going to have to completely transform the way that we operate right fossil fuels in my lifetime will become a thing of the past. That mm -hmm. is true. Yeah. And yet they want to be able to extract as much from the ground as possible, as much money as possible mm. for as long as possible. And what they're doing now, I mean, they're seeding climate doomism. Um, there's a lot of research showing, um, I spoke to Michael E. Mann recently, mm -hmm. one of the scientists behind the hockey stick graph. Yeah. They're investing in climate doomism, the, the dystopian images of climate change that cause people to think, okay, well, it's too far gone or it's too late. And of course, they're seeding these so-called debates, which are not debates at all, so mm. that there's enough confusion or misinformation in our minds to not just say, well, we need to immediately act and here's how we need to do it. So, you know, our mindsets, our stories, our culture is you know, there's a vested interest in yeah. keeping us stuck in the past. Mm. And that's why we all have a responsibility to actually reject those stories that have been impressed upon us and say, well, I'm going to do something radically different. Mm. You've got a, a lot of young people, you know, you're specifically focusing on youth, a lot of people looking that look up to you and learn from you. You know, what message would you like to give to, to those people out there? That's a good question. Um, well, not, as, if, as if everything you haven't, you've said along the way isn't an awesome message. Um, when I first started out, I felt a lot of imposter syndrome for being a young person. Okay. I thought, who am I to be in these spaces having these conversations when I'm a teenager, when I don't have a university degree, when I'm not as experienced as the people sat at this table? Mm. And yet... I was able to shift my mindset from mentors who saw more potential in me than I was able to see myself to realize that not only was my youthfulness not a barrier that I had to overcome, but it was in fact my superpower. You know, 
my youthfulness is what brought a fresh perspective when mm. that was what was needed more than anything else. Than, you yeah. know, my my education was what uniquely placed me to think, you know, outside of the box and think of other ways to kind of solve these problems. And that's true of every young person I talk to. You know, we kind of spoke to that earlier. Mm. You know, we know which problems we're passionate about before we know who we are. Do any of us really know who we are? Probably not. Yeah. But if we focus on those problems, if we choose not to do ourselves the disservice of ignoring that eco-anxiety or ignoring those internal alarm bells, mm. then we all have the power to create enormous change. So my advice would be don't let any of those self-limiting stories get in your way. Don't let other people tell you what you are or are not capable of and just focus on the problems that you want to solve. I love being doing these things with such awesome people that I <laughs> learn so much from. Hey, now how can people help get involved with you yeah. and your work and what, what's um force of nature we've got force of nature just google it yes is that easy is it just <laughs> going to come up straight away so our website is force of nature dot xyz and it's a uh, yeah for generations x y and z yeah. there you go um and we now i mean we're running programs to schools and universities around the world mm -hmm. we work with some of the world's biggest multinationals P&G, Unilever, PepsiCo, the, com the companies that I made those documentaries mm. about, um, you know, we now work with them. Uh, we connect them to young people and we shift the way that they think about the issues. Um, and of course, we have this incredible growing community of people from all corners who are putting their hand up to say, yep, I don't want to sit on the sidelines. I want to do something. Mm -hmm. And um, we also ha now have a whole batch of free resources for anyone who's at the start of their eco-anxiety or activism journey to make more sense of those feelings and to begin to understand more about themselves so that they can show up with those feelings to take action. Awesome. So Clover, it's an absolute, <laughs> like I said at the start, absolute pleasure. Little did I know <laughs> what I was talking about. I can't believe <laughs> that we've, uh, I, you know, I was stuck in the middle school when Clover was a shining light in high school and not stuck in the middle school. I was like <laughs> just shining in the middle school. Uh, and I didn't really get the chance to meet you yeah. that well. And little did I know, I didn't even know that you grew up in a place that I'd lived at. Um, but I've learned so much. Thank today you. right now and i'm so inspired and motivated thank you um and i thank you for being a part of get lost education and i thank you for everything you're doing with force of nature uh, it's, it's truly amazing well thank you so much for having me mm. and even though our paths didn't cross as much as they should have back then i'm so that glad that they have now <laughs> yeah yeah well, thank you very much thank you yeah. sal yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining me on get lost education see you next time